Well, good afternoon. Welcome to CSIS. I'm Steve Morrison. I'm Senior Vice President here at CSIS. We're delighted today to be able to host Michael Botticelli, Acting Director of the White House Office of National Drug Policy, uh, and Ambassador William Brownfield, the Assistant Secretary in the INL Bureau at the Department of State, International Narcotics and Law Enforcement. Um, let me just say a few, a few words here. This, this event, which is the first time that we've had the opportunity to, to welcome uh, uh, Michael Botticelli to CSIS, this, this event follows a couple of different opportunities we've had over the last uh, year, year and a half, to focus on policies around both domestic and international around drug policy. Um, on March 31st of last year, we hosted Ambassador Brownfield along with um, Ruth Dreyfus, former head of state, Switzerland, former health minister, along with Michelle Kazakshin, both of them uh, uh, here uh, representing the Global Commission on Drug Policy. And last September, September 11th, um, we had the good fortune to host uh, Richard Branson and Michelle Kazakshin also uh, on the release of that commission's most recent report. I want to offer special thanks to a number of people who helped make this possible. Sahil Angelo, my colleague here from CSIS, was, was very instrumental in putting everything together. Will Jenkins uh, from uh, ONDCP, uh, very helpful, as well as Eric Green from the State Department INL. Special thanks to them. Um, we're here really to talk about uh, a drug policy at home and global, globally. And I think what we'll hear is that there's quite a bit of dynamism that intersects and crosses over among these two domains. Um, the Obama administration's uh, been quite active, as we'll hear. This is a period of, of quite energetic innovation and reform across a spectrum of different issues. Uh, President Obama just recently uh, uh, had a, an extended set of remarks, YouTube interview, um, in which he was speaking directly to uh, to the uh, efforts underway in several states in this country in terms of uh, legalization of cannabis and what that meant in terms of the power of referenda, what that meant in terms of states' rights and how to, how to, how to navigate the differences between federal government and Department of Justice equities in this issue and the states' rights issues. Um, it was a very interesting and very forward-leaning statement from the president and I think quite encouraging. We've also got the UN special session, the UNGAS session scheduled for the early part of 2016 on global drug policy. This is the first occasion uh, since 1998 when there's been such a gathering to review uh, where we are in terms of the conventions and ref uh, uh, further refinement of the global approaches on, on that. And so it's a great opportunity as we move towards uh, Vienna in March, uh, the meetings in Vienna on, on drug policy, narcotic uh, uh, approaches to hear from Ambassador Brownfield about the preparations and what lies ahead in this period. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to ask um, Michael and, and, and Bill to each open up with uh, six to eight minutes of top line prepared remarks about uh, their respective areas and, and the points that they want to get out in terms of the major policy considerations at the moment. And then we'll have a conversation across um, those lines among ourselves. And then we'll open the floor to you all for, uh, for your comments and questions. And so when we get to that point, uh, we'll bundle together a number of interventions. Please uh, I, uh, put your hand up. We'll bring a microphone to you. Please identify yourself. Be very succinct. Make a single intervention. We'll bundle those together and come back to our speakers. Uh, so I'm going to ask um, uh, Michael to open up if you wouldn't mind. I would not. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks, Steve, for the invitation. And uh, I, I relish this six to eight minutes because um, I love being with Ambassador Brownfield, but uh, getting my interventions in place when we work together is, is uh, always an interesting dynamic. I uh, always <laughs> defer to the Director of National Drug Control Policy. No, it, it's really a pleasure to be here. And it, it, it actually is 
a pleasure to work with uh, with the ambassador and with state. And so I want to spend a, uh, the majority of my time in terms of opening remarks is talking about where we are with drug policy in the United States because I think that under, uh, not I think, that under the Obama administration we've really undertaken some significant reforms as it relates to drug policy in the United States. I think for you know a long time we've relied on uh, anecdote um, to guide policy, um, and you know, under the this administration, we've really focused on a science-based, evidence-based strategy to do that. And you know, as a context for this, you know, the vast majority of my career I spent in public health, and I worked at the Massachusetts Public Health Department. You know, pretty forward-leading state with a pretty forward-leading health department. And I remember being there um, when the inaugural policy was released. And I remember then Director Kurlikowski talking about the fact that we couldn't arrest and incarcerate, incarcerate our way out of this problem, that we needed to rely specifically uh, on public health approaches to this disease, that while law enforcement plays a key role in what we do, it was not going to be the solution to our problems. And I was like, whoa, this is not the ONDCP that I am used to. And really, you know, embracing some cutting edge, um, at least for the administration, kind of cutting edge activities like needle exchange programs, like overdose prevention programs with naloxone. And, you know, so from my perspective, you know, I had, uh, I was really fortunate to have the opportunity to come to, a, come to ONDCP in November 2012. So it really, um, I think, is important for us to understand kind of where we've tried to go, both in terms of policy and budget as, as it uh, focuses on that. Um, you know, one of the areas that we have been really trying to focus on our public health strategies, really look looking at from both a policy perspective and a budget perspective, focusing on things like prevention, treatment, and recovery. And let me give you a couple examples of kind of what are some of the significant reforms that we've seen. You know, the other piece that I'll share with you is I, I'm actually in recovery from my own addictive disorder. So the fact that, you know, I am um, the hopefully soon to be director if the Senate votes the way that I want them to on Monday, um, you know, is, is emblematic of where we are. So I am not a general, I am not a law enforcement person, I am a public health person. And you know, I'm an openly gay man in recovery. And so if that's indicative of kind of who the president has chosen to lead drug policy, then you know, I hope we have more reforms to come. So you know, uh, one of the areas that I think is particularly important is the Affordable Care Act as we talk about this issue. So if you think about substance use disorders, uh, we have about 23 million people in the United States who meet criteria for a substance use disorder. And previous to the Affordable Care Act, only 10% of those got care at a specialty treatment program. And it's one of the reasons, like myself, that people with untreated addiction actually intersect with the criminal justice system, is we don't do a good job at increasing and making sure that people have access to treatment. So the Affordable Care Act revolutionizes that in two ways. Basically, it makes um, substance use disorder treatment an essential health benefit of any of the expansion plans that we have, both in Medicaid and the exchange plans. The second piece that it does, it basically says that insurance companies have to uh, offer these benefits at parity with other health benefits. For a long time, and particularly in the private insurance world, um, they used a variety of mechanisms like lifetime limits, copays, and deductibles to limit people's access. So that is a real profound change in, in how we think about drug policy and how we think about access to recovery. So I think it's really important that we talk about that. The, the other piece that I think this administration really needs some credit for is, is how we've looked at things, um, how we've approached sentencing reform activity. Um, and, and it really is, I think, important to understand the track record of both the President and the Attorney General, particularly as it relates to low-level offenders who are coming in contact with the criminal justice system largely as a result of their own addictive disorders. And when we think of our policy, we look at it in three fundamental ways. One, how do we divert people away from the criminal justice system in the first place? So how do we enhance policy? How do we enhance practice? How do we do things like increasing the opportunity for police department to, to have a different intervention other than just arresting someone and incarcerating them. 
We know that the vast majority of people who are in our prison facilities are there largely because of their own substance use disorders. And how do we make sure they get good care and treatment? And then how do we make sure people who are recovering from their addiction, and particularly those with criminal records, don't face lifelong barriers as a result of their criminal records um, uh, uh, because of their addictive disorders? I'll share with you a personal anecdote. It was really interesting um, as one of the highest level folks who are in recovery with my own criminal record going through an FBI vetting process and trying to explain kind of, you know, those arrest records. And, uh, uh, but, but I think it provides an opportunity to do that. The other piece that I want to share with you is how we've begun to really work with law enforcement in a different way. And I think many of you have, have seen the reporting about the dramatic increase in opioid-related deaths in the United States. So, so we now have 120 people dying every single day of a drug overdose in the United States that's largely driven by prescription drug and opioids. And through the work of, of our office, we are, are basically trying to have, making sure that law enforcement is equipped with naloxone, which is this remarkable antidote uh, to reverse an overdose. And, and we've seen two things happen. One, this incredible uptake on, with local law enforcement on saving people's lives. And so we now have law enforcement entities across the country doing it. Um, and as well as state laws that provide immunity from people who are reporting an overdose from criminal prosecution. But the kind of the byproduct of that, and you'll hear we were actually just at a conference the other day, is that it dramatically changes the relationship of local law enforcement with the drug using community. And it has precipitated a conversation about how can the law enforcement community have a different response to people with substance use disorders, not only in saving their lives, but using that as an opportunity to get people into care and treatment. So I think that these are kind of pieces that um, we want to make sure that are part of the work that we do. You know, it's very interesting to me, and I'll end here and turn it over to the ambassador, that I, you know, I don't come from an international background, but one of the things that's really astounding to me is how drug policy in the United States just gets reverberated across the across the world. And it's really tremendous, and I see Ambassador Simons here, who's been a huge part of that, um, of how many, many countries across this hemisphere are, are and across the world, quite honestly, are talking about um, and moving toward implementing public health strategies as it relates to their own uh, issues. Now, you know, I'd like to see them fund um, public health strategies, but also things like alternatives to incarceration. So, and this is not to a country, but it's really, it's really been um, heartening to me to think about how U.S. drug policy has precipitated a conversation uh, among many, many countries as they rethink their own policies. The last piece that I'll say that's really heartening um, to me is even within the international world, focusing on recovery and how we can lessen the stigma of addiction and people who are, uh, have addiction in the international community. So working with our State Department, we actually passed a resolution last year at uh, UNODC focusing on recovery. I got to lead a panel discussion uh, among, among countries about how we can continue to promote this concept of treating people with dignity and respect and diminishing the barriers. So it's really been, um, uh, um, I think, heartening. The last thing I know we'll spend some more time on this has been kind of our, our view of legalization. And, and I don't come at this from an ideological perspective. I come at this from a scientific perspective. And, you know, the, and the American Academy of Pediatrics had an excellent policy piece that came out last week um, uh, not supporting legalization. And one of the things that they said that I think resonates with us about how we think about legalization efforts is that the, the most salient criteria as we think about drug policy in the United States should be about what are the harms as it relates to the youth of our country. And that really is the pivotal reason for us why we have not been supportive of legalization efforts. It doesn't mean, however, that we, need, that we don't need to continue to think about how we reform our criminal justice system, how we deal with issues of disproportionality as it relates to arrest and incarceration. It doesn't mean that. It means that we believe that there's another way to move forward um, as we think about drug policy in the United States that is balanced. It's not about a war on drugs, and it's not about legalization. And I know we'll talk more about that, but I just wanted to put that out there as we as as we've thought about how we formulate drug policy and our position around marijuana. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much.
Ambassador Brown. Shall I launch? Uh, by the way, thank you very much, Steve and, uh, and CSIS for the opportunity uh, and providing us this forum for this conversation and this discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, there's some logic uh, to the, the, the fact that I am following uh, in this presentation Michael Botticelli. It is not just because uh, he has a more handsome set of green shoelaces than my somewhat dull and boring black shoelaces, uh, but, but rather because what the director of, of National Drug Control Policy has done for you and for me is to lay out the domestic realities of this issue here in the United States of America. And that, to a very considerable extent, is my starting point as I try to engage on behalf of the United States of America in the international community on this issue. I obviously cannot take positions, express views, uh, and offer a US position that does not take into account what we are doing here in the United States of America. But that is not the only set of realities that I must deal with as I prepare uh, for the year 2015 in the international context. Another set of realities is we are going to have, in about four weeks' time, a, a meeting on the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs that will establish for the United Nations drug policies, reform ideas, concepts, and lead on to a special session of the United Nations in the year 2016. Regardless of U.S. domestic realities, those international meetings will occur. There are some other realities out there that, that some of us in this room, uh, obviously not including Ambassador Simon, who's aware of everything that I have said, am saying, and will say at any point for the rest of my life, but some of the, the others among us may not be so much aware. First, there is a tremendous debate in the international community between those who wish to reform and those who wish to continue current policies. Those who wish to change or completely alter the three international drug control conventions and those who wish to preserve them. Those, to make it as simplistic as possible, those who support legalization, and those who support prohibition. This is not an exclusively US argument, ladies and gentlemen. And as I prepare to work through uh, this set of challenges in this year and the year ahead, we have to take these into account. And I'll offer you two more realities uh, that while they may not sound overwhelming to you, there are major, major issues that we have to factor in from the United States foreign policy perspective. One, any change in the international legal architecture related to drugs requires by UN rules something in the vicinity of 120 member states to endorse before the change is enacted uh, into treaty or convention. That's nearly, I think it's 60%, it is almost two thirds. In other words, there's going to be no major legal change unless a tremendous number of governments agree. And second reality for me, although it sounds domestic, it is definitely quite international as well. There's also going to be no change in the US position on any treaty or convention unless I, or Mr. Botticelli, can line up 67 United States senators to agree with that new treaty, that new convention, that new international obligation. I will leave to you, far more expert than I am, how easy it is to provide, to produce 67 senators in agreement uh, on any major issue in the world today. And I'll not go any further down the road than that, because while I may be dumb, I am not completely stupid. So my challenge, I suggest to all of you, is to try to find a way whereby the United States continues to exercise leadership in this field, which I hope most, not all, but most would agree is a helpful and positive thing. Leadership that, in my opinion, should be pragmatic, 
practical and realistic in terms of where we are trying to guide, nudge, prod, or work with the larger international community representing the 7.5 billion inhabitants of planet Earth at this time. I would suggest, and I will right now, uh, suggest that we should start with some sort of common understanding in terms of the legal architecture. Some of you, and certainly Steve, have heard this before because I rolled this out for the very first time, I believe in this exact room, uh, about a year or so ago. When I suggested the world should be able to reach consensus on four basic principles. First principle, don't try dramatic change in the three international conventions. Not because they are perfect, because I acknowledge they, like any written document, uh, are not perfect, but rather because getting something new probably is beyond the realm of the possible at this point, and something that is good but not perfect perhaps is better than having nothing at all. Principle number two what I call the flexibility principle. But I want to be clear by what, uh, on what I mean by flexibility. I do not mean that every government should be allowed to interpret the three conventions as it wishes. That would be rather uh, a, a weak set of conventions. But rather, within the conventions themselves, there is discretion and flexibility that is permitted by the text of the conventions. Why not take advantage of that discretion and flexibility to accomplish some things in terms of reforms, new ideas, new approaches? Third principle, from my perspective, is what I call tolerance of differing national policies. Let us accept uh, that over the past 50 years, the international community's attempt to get all 190, I think it's 94 members of the United Nations, to adopt exactly the same drug control policy has not been an overwhelming success. Let us assume, therefore, and accept that governments and nations responding to their own national conditions and realities will have somewhat differing policies. Let us have an international approach that accepts that reality, quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, because it's going to happen whether we accept it or want it or not. And my fourth suggested principle is the principle that regardless of our position on legalization versus prohibitionism, uh, on, on reform versus continuity, we all agree that the criminal organizations, those institutions, that conduct activity for purpose of economic gain using violence and blood as their mechanisms for earning revenues in order to traffic and market an illicit product should in fact be resisted by all nations on the planet regardless of what our individual <coughs> national drug policies might be. Integrity of the conventions, accept some flexibility within the conventions, tolerance for differing national positions, and consensus against the criminal organizations. Now that's a framework, ladies and gents. Uh, Mr. Morrison would say a framework is not a policy. He is right. And I'll throw out some ideas that I think would constitute a policy. And you're going to hear more on these in the course of this year and the next. One, we have just heard from the Director of National Drug Control Policy. Public health, public health, public health. This is not a criminal justice problem. At least it is not exclusively a criminal justice problem. We should, quite correctly, focus more of our international attention on the health aspects of this issue. Second, let's say it right up front. 
criminal justice reform. We dance around the issue sometimes, sometimes we say it quite bluntly, sometimes we use simplistic expressions, and sometimes people speak for 45 minutes trying to say the same thing, which is we should entertain reform of our criminal justice process where it makes sense. What might make sense? Sentencing reform? I think we should be open to that. Alternatives to incarceration <coughs> might not be a bad idea, certainly in some situations. Drug courts rather than criminal justice courts to manage, process, or adjudicate these sorts of issues. These are the sorts of ideas that smart men and women, I hope, will roll out into international dialogue in the course of 2015, 2016. A third concept that I'm pushing as hard as I can is let's find ways for greater international cooperation. We will have to accept, ladies and gentlemen, that the world is a complicated place. There are today some countries that have chosen to legalize entire categories of what in other places are prescribed drugs, and other countries are executing people who traffic in those drugs. We've somehow got to find enough common ground that we can do some things together, accepting that different countries will take different approaches. And the fourth of my so-called policy prescriptions, since I've said it once, I'll say it again, is let's think of new ways to address the organized criminal side of this equation. Not the people who consume, not the people who are buying and selling in small quantities, but the people who constitute multi-billion dollar, multinational enterprises that are marketing the stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, I would close by suggesting, optimistically, that we've had some success in opening up this aperture of dialogue and having a useful conversation. Ambassador Simon, just in case you're not aware of who he is, he's sitting three rows back, <laughs> just to the left of the, uh, of the aisle as I'm looking at it. He had considerable success about four months ago in bringing together the nations of the Organization of American States to address th just these issues. And they came up with what I think, Paul, was actually a pretty good declaration. I hope others will ask me about it in the course of the question and answer session. Ladies and gentlemen, my closing sentence is this. There is room for reform in this field. 2016 is not 1961. The world has changed. We're not idiots, all of us in this room. I think we acknowledge that reality. But let's acknowledge one other reality as well, as Mr. Botticelli mentioned in his own closing remarks. And that is, there is a reason why 100 years ago, most of the governments in the world decided to control access to a certain number of drugs. It is because they were found to be harmful to those who used them. So as we address reform, as we think about change, as we discuss new ways of doing things, let's not forget that there was a reason why we paid particular attention to these drugs and make sure if I can use the old saying uh, of so many decades in the past, we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Thank you very much, Dr. M. I relinquish the floor. Thank you so much. Um, thank you both. Um, Michael, uh, congratulations, and uh, I wish you the best on my Not yet. The He's boat. not confirmed yet. We're, we're going to congratulate you in advance. Thank you knowing that that will raise your probabilities. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about the agenda that, that you've outlined and, and which is quite consistent with what Bill outlined. It, this reform agenda, this emphasis on public health, on human rights, on changing the law enforcement outlook and paradigm, this is all reflective at some level to changes in our society, mm -hmm. normatively, uh, 
it reflects uh, shifts that have happened across party lines. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, something that is tied to, as you point out, broad trends in terms of reform of U.S. health systems and the like. Um, tell us a bit more about, as you are thinking about this, as you're talking to members of Congress, as you are out talking to the different constituencies within the United States, what do you see, how do you see this, this sea change that's underway unfolding? Because it seems to me that it's created the space for you to carry forward what is a true reform agenda. It's made that possible in a period when division in many other places mm -hmm. has been quite deep Correct. and quite prohibitive. So what is it that permits you to, to feel so confident about your ability to move ahead? So, um, it, it, it's really interesting, and I think if I have any probability of being con it confirmed, it's because we actually have folks who are coming at this, they're coming to the same place for sometimes different reasons, right? So, so if you think about judicial reform and criminal mm -hmm. justice reform, there are some very conservative people in this country who are undertaking significant criminal justice reform largely because of cost. Right? So you think of Texas, quite honestly, as the incarceration capital of the world. I would like to think they came at it from a humanistic standpoint. But, but I think, quite honestly, they came at it from a cost standpoint and said, we can't keep this up. Right? So other than health care, I think criminal justice costs are the second leading expenditure at the state level. And so you have very, very conservative people and very, very conservative folks um, coming at this from a cost standpoint. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, I think you have the healthcare system coming at this from the same angle. And they know that quite honestly, untreated addiction has a significant level of cost as it relates to, mm -hmm. you know, so as we think of cost containment strategies to do that. I think the other piece, and, 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 and I hope I'm not being overly optimistic by this, you know, as we've seen the evolution and policy change on a whole host of issues, and I think of gay marriage as being one of them, right? So how have you fundamentally changed that policy? Not to be overly simplistic, but part of it was people's willingness to come out about who they were. Fundamentally changed the way that all of us think about gay folk. And it drove public policy. You know, someone gave me a bit of advice a long time ago, and I believe this. Science and data don't often drive public policy. People drive public policy. Mm -hmm. And so part of, I think, this movement around, and this is, you know, I don't, I'm not open about my recovery to be self-congratulatory. I'm open about my recovery because we need that kind of political movement, that kind of visibility to change public perception and to change the way that we uh, think about this. So, so, so I do think that part of what draws very different folks from very, very different places along the political spectrum come to the same, they come to the same place, but I think they come at it for different reasons. Bill, have you had a chance to get out to speak with different audiences here in the United States? Sure, I try to do it. Domestically about the international agenda, and what do people say to you? Well, um, before I say that, I, I, I do wish to protest most emphatically Mr. Botticelli's taunting of the state of Texas and suggesting uh, anything I forgot. negative about the state of uh, Austin, Texas. Whatsoever. Austin has a sense enough, of exceptionalism. Enough said. But. I, I shall return to Dr. Morrison's uh, uh, perfectly valid and legitimate question. Look, I, I am not going to suggest that there's a monolithic set of views uh, when, when I'm... When I'm uh, working around the country working this issue. Uh, I would suggest, as, as makes perfectly good sense, that most American citizens look at the drug issue through the prism of their own experiences, family, schools, communities, business, uh, and are not thinking necessarily in terms of the international aspects. When they are thinking of the international aspects, they tend to see the negative side of it. Gangs in their communities that are, that, that are part of this process, or the belief, sometimes erroneous, uh, that the product comes in universally from overseas uh, and, and from foreign countries. At the end of the day, the dialogue tends to be more than 50% on the impact of 
the, the drug issue, the international drug issue on their lives, their families, their communities, uh, and considerably less than 50% in terms of what we are doing or can do overseas. Now that's partly my responsibility. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that I'm going uh, around the country to do, uh, to try to, to establish with them, as well as with everyone in this room, that there is a link between what we are doing or trying to do overseas and then what happens here on our own streets and in our own communities. Our success or, or failure uh, in terms of addressing the root causes that generate drug production or transportation to the United States has an obvious impact on our lives here. That would be my long-winded response to your Thank simple you. question. For those of you standing in the back, there are open seats up front. If you care to come and grab a seat, you don't need to stand up. If you care to get seated, there's a couple right, right here in front. There's one right there. There's a couple over here. So please come on down if you care to uh, grab, grab a seat. Um, <coughs> let's stay on the domestic front for a moment. We know we have a heroin epidemic right now. It's a very serious epidemic. It's linked in with OxyContin and other opioid drug abuse. Can you say a few words about how you understand that? What is driving that? And I know this is top, a top issue, a top preoccupation in the kind of strategy needed to roll that back. And it has affected innumerable communities across the country. And it's always quite surprising when you're in a bucolic setting and you see, so you see a billboard on heroin addiction. Um, and people, talk, people are talking about this in, in, in very new and, and compelling ways. Can you say a bit sure. uh, about the root causes and what you see as the strategy sure. and the path going um, forward? It, you know, and actually this does have international implications. So, so if you look at where we are, particularly with heroin use, you know, we, we know that the root cause has been the overprescribing of prescription pain medication by physicians in the United States. So recent report by the CDC showed that we now, um, that physicians are prescribing um, uh, enough pain medication to give every American a bottle of pain pills every day. Um, and again, you know, we're, we want to make sure that people who need those medications for pain get them. Um, and if you look at heroin, newer users to heroin, four-fifths of them started by misusing prescription pain medication. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then as people progress in their chronicity and their um, acuity of, of opiate addiction, particularly on prescription drugs, m a, a, what appears to be a small percentage of them are transitioning to heroin. And so why are they transitioning to heroin? Well, one of the causes is that we have been inundated largely from Mexico and South America by a very cheap, very pure supply of heroin, right? So if you're gonna pay a dollar a milligram on the street for a pill, for a 60 you know, milligram pill, or you have the opportunity to spend five or $10 on a bag of heroin that has the very same effect, doesn't take an economist, you know, a lot of math to say, I'm going to start using heroin. So we, you know, we have seen this progression, um, and that's one of the areas that has been of significant concern. So while prescription drug overdoses still eclipse heroin overdoses, we've seen significant increases in the number of heroin users. To, to get to the question you asked before, Steve, I think it's also why we've been able to have folks, a broad continuum of folks engaged with us on drug mm -hmm. policy. Because mm -hmm. this is kind of, you know, we've had heroin use for a long time. But this is you know. a shared threat? But it's a shared threat. It's a different demographic. It's, it's um, in uh, um, more uh, suburban and rural areas that we've mm -hmm. seen before. So, so we have been engaged with just about all of the governors in every state, as, as well as folks in Congress who historically for whom drug policy has never been their mm -hmm. top priority issue. Mm -hmm. So so again, I think it's it's another area where we have been able to work with people who have historically not seen the drug policy issues as one of their top priorities. Now, one of the issues that surfaces uh, uh, often in both the domestic debate and the international debate is about improving access to palliative care mm -hmm. for folks that are end of life or folks that are suffering uh, from a severe medical uh, condition and require that and 
trying to get greater flexibility, um, both domestically but also globally. This is an issue in the, uh, under consideration for the UNGAS. How does that match up against what is kind of an emergency in a way, I know. the heroin epidemic and the oxycontin, you know, the, uh, the abuse that predates and drives that? Well, you, you know, it's interesting, and this conversation has come up at uh, UNODC a number of times. And, you know, um, the, you know, when you look at many of the countries that have a prescription drug issue, United States, Canada, some European countries, it's, a, it's about relative access to health care. And, and, and I think that part of what we have offered, quite honestly, to the rest of the countries thinking about how they get good medicines to people who really need them is to basically heed some lessons learned from mm -hmm. us and say, you know, we think that there are lessons that we have learned about how you can um, minimize some of the diversion and abuse issues as you think about how you implement um, public health practice, how you think about clinician guidelines, and how you think about care to make sure that people do get really good access to good pain medications when they need them. So, you know, we have often offered some kind of opportunities to, to and cautionary words for other countries as they think about and, and try to look at access, better access to healthcare and medications, to, to do this in a way that doesn't replicate, I think, uh, things that have happened mm -hmm. here. Bill, is this an area where you think there's potential progress in the uh, special session? Uh, yes, although I'd, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd want to qualify that pretty carefully. D do keep in mind, prescription drugs uh, are, are completely, absolutely, and totally permitted under the three international drug control conventions, as you would expect them to be. That is, that, that is, the, <coughs> that is the one area where you would, uh, where you would expect to be allowed uh, to, to use this particular or these particular products. That is to say, a trained and licensed physician who determines that this particular medication uh, is required or called for or indicated uh, for a, a, a particular medical condition. The problem, obviously, and what the conventions themselves, as well as the, the bodies that provide the guidance uh, to the United Nations system, uh, as well as our own government uh, are attempting to limit, control, and ideally eliminate is the abuse and diversion uh, of those prescription drugs. Now, could the UNGAS come up with ideas in terms of how better to do that? I suppose so, but again, this is where, where I, I, I come back to you with my closing comment of let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, at, the, at the end of the day, I believe, I hope, what we are all looking for uh, is a solution and an outcome where qualified professional physicians are making the determination uh, as to when certain products should be used as medication and not to take them out of this formula. And when we move into licensed physicians, we move into an area that for the last 60, 70, 80 years has very definitely fallen within <coughs> national systems. One nation's uh, physician licensing system may be very different from another. Is it an area for possible consideration? Yes, but it's not going to be a simple issue is what mm -hmm. I would suggest to you. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about marijuana, cannabis. You mentioned your continued concern about harm. Um, we're in a fragmented moment here. We've got states that are moving ahead with um, legalized recreational use. We've had a number of states that have already uh, put in place the medical use. Um, there's the existing federal law. There's the tension that exists between what's happening in Colorado or Washington or Oregon, Alaska, maybe DC. The tension between that versus the, um, the, the conventions. Uh, so it's, it's a, it, it, it seems to be a somewhat mixed picture and one where uh, you have the president saying, well, we need, this is part of a criminal justice reform issue. This, this is one about um, uh, nonviolent offenders. There's a racial dimension to this. It's about shifting to a public health approach. But there's a deep ambivalence running through all of these discussions around marijuana. Can you say a bit, about, a bit more about that? And how do you navigate that as the leader in this, in this area? 
I, you know, I think there are a couple dimensions to this which are really important. I think when you look at many of the president's comments, he really is talking about this from a criminal justice context, that, you know, we can continue down this path of arresting and incarcerating, and particularly, you know, particularly young kids of color and the impact that we see here. And, you know, completely agree with that as it relates to drug policy. But, but when you look at kind of what the impact of legalization might portend, for us, and, and, and not just legalization, but I also have significant concern with the commercialization of marijuana. Mm -hmm. You know, having done public health for a long time, I think that we see, quite honestly, the industry being using some of the same tactics, quite honestly, that the tobacco industry has used as they thought about marketing their product, right? So basically, um, uh, uh, I think not full disclosure about the health harms associated with marijuana. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, you know, some sense that a tightly regulated market is not going to increase um, uh, access to youth. We now have more youth in this country that smoke marijuana than uh, tobacco, and we clearly know the health harms associated with marijuana as it relates to youth, um, of not, uh, quite honestly, portraying this substance as addictive when clearly we know that it is. So, so I think there is significant, so, so two things. One is, you know, this is where we come from in terms of unanimity of policy. That said, he's also made clear that he, um, uh, with the De Department of Justice monitoring this, is keeping a close eye on what's happening in Colorado and Washington. Mm -hmm. And the Cole memo you know, laid out eight criteria mm -hmm. for Colorado and Washington, broad array of public health and public safety criteria that they need to be held accountable in terms of mitigating the harms with that. So the memo was the Department of Justice. There was guidance. the Department of Justice memo that basically saying we're not preempting the referenda in Washington, Colorado, but we are reserving the right to take subsequent action based on our monitoring of eight criteria, again, public health, public safety criteria, um, and that we will continue to monitor the situation and, and, and in essence reserve the right to take subsequent action based, based on, on those criteria. So, so our office, um, you know, and again, you know, I, I, I don't want to speak out of both sides of my mouth. You know, if we say that we're science and data driven, we need to be science and data driven. And so part of what we're looking at, and these are largely, you know, publicly available data sets, as well as work with the National Institute of Drug Abuse, is looking at, and in concert with Colorado and Washington, what has been the impact? What mm -hmm. is the impact? I think, quite honestly, it's too soon to tell in terms of what those uh, uh, issues mean. I think Colorado, by its own acknowledgement, saying we have a problem here with edibles, mm -hmm. um, and we need mm -hmm. to really ratchet that back. So, so uh, you know, again, I think it's really important for us to continue uh, to uh, oppose legalization, to monitor what's happening in Colorado and in subsequent states. So how soon do you think we'll be able, um, because my sense is a lot of states are sitting and waiting to see what happens, and, and there is an ambivalence among thoughtful people. People come down on this issue in a number of different ways. So how soon are people going to be able to make judgments around the wisdom or merits of what's happening in Colorado and Washington? And what are going to be the key criteria? Sure. So, so our offices, you know, we, we do not intend to issue some level of definitive report yeah. saying, oh, it worked. No, yeah. it didn't. Yeah. But, but part of it is a commitment to continue to roll out public data. L largely, these are existing data sets that exist that look at um, uh, things like youth use, that looks at things like treatment admissions, that look at things like uh, 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 drug driving episodes, that look at diversion of marijuana from one state to another. Mm -hmm. so, so part of what you know, we feel a responsibility at ONDCP is to make available those, those data sets to, to allow people to make a determination on kind of what, what they think um, you know, the, the impact is. So you know, it's not our intention to, again, to, to issue this definitive report saying, yes, it works, no, it doesn't. But Steve, I get to jump in on this because, because what Michael has laid out quite correctly is the United States of America's approach to marijuana and the larger legalization issue. And I, I believe that's exactly right and correct, as I understand it. In 1776, we decided we'd govern ourselves, thank you very much. And sometime around 1788, we decided the system by which we would do it. We got states, we got a federal government. I've got no problem with this whatsoever. But 
Bear with me on this, please. We have also ratified three international drug control conventions. In two of those conventions, marijuana is placed in the annex of a proscribed product, which the national government is expected to control uh, and to the extent possible prohibit, except for in very limited examples. My task as your representative, what you pay me to do, is to march out to those international organizations and explain to them how everything that Steve and Michael have just talked about still leave us in compliance with our international obligations. Now, this is a little bit tricky. I would remind all of you that most governments in the world continue to have fairly strong views on cannabis and uh, that the oversight bodies that the United Nations, of which we are a member, have set up, particularly the International Narcotics Control Board, has been pretty clear, I would even say at times severe, with me in terms of not accepting the argument that we are in full and complete compliance. And this is what I was talking about earlier on in terms of saying, we are an independent and sovereign nation. We will make our own decisions and determinations. We are governed by our constitution. Thank <coughs> you very much. But please work with me, ladies and gentlemen, as we figure how to project those national realities into the international community. Sorry, I got carried away, but I just had to vent. Well, I know that that's probably one of the more difficult things for you to try and explain. Right, because it's not patently, you know, obvious as to how you reconcile those things, and that—that's just the nature of our, di the diplomatic predicament that we face. Right? At Texans are very good at that sort of so thing, despite the savage attacks by Mr. Botticelli, so a man from okay. Massachusetts. You're doing okay. <laughs> let's let's talk just for a second about har harm reduction, about substitution therapy, about needle and syringe exchange, all of which are highly sensitive and divisive issues, but ones which many are arguing need to be pushed forward as, a, as an element both at the domestic and international mm -hmm. uh, context. Uh, can you say a bit? Sure. And, and then ask Bill to comment. Sure. Um, for as long as I've been doing this work, I hate the phrase harm reduction um, because it means so many different things to so many different people. If we're talking about a wide variety of interventions for active users, that minimize the health harms with their using all for it, right? So is it a semantic issue? It's something that we, and culturally well, and politically is uncomfortable, but no, the no, meaning of it is not uncomfortable? Uh, um, I, the meaning of it is not uncomfortable. I think, what is I, I think what's hard from a policy perspective is where do we draw the line on those kinds of harm reduction policies that we support and those that we're continuing to look, uh, to look at. So again, you know, we have always supported uh, needle exchange programs. We, you know, continue to support overdose prevention education programs, um, you know, and a wide variety of other activities. Um, you know, it's interesting to me that in the kind of international world, they look at medication-assisted treatment as a harm reduction therapy, which doesn't quite square with mm -hmm. me. We look at it as a valid treatment approach, and you know. Um, Part of what we just laid out yesterday with the president's budget is even strengthening the United States efforts around access to medication-assisted mm -hmm. treatments. So these are the most highly eva you know, evaluated medications that we have. So, so you know, we do support a wide variety of interventions that diminish the, the health harms associated, and quite honestly, the mortality associated with, mm -hmm. uh, with particularly with injection drug use. Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree, not surprisingly, 100% uh, with Michael. Uh, this entire area of discussion falls absolutely squarely in, in what I describe as the public health uh, component, which we urge, accept, agree, support, plead with and vote for uh, enhanced consideration in the international context. This is a good area for discussion. I do not say we should agree with every single proposal that comes in under the label of 
harm reduction. I do say this is a valid issue for 194 uh, member states of the United Nations to discuss in the context of the formal structure of the United Nations, in the context of their individual national drug control policies. Uh, this is an area where I do believe uh, the nations of the world should be able uh, to reach some useful conclusions. As I might add, Dr. Simon, uh, the, the OAS states did in September of last year in Guatemala City uh, when they discussed public health in their final declaration is it as an area where the 34 states of the Western Hemisphere agreed we should address and focus efforts as we addressed the drug issue. Thank you. So You're we can welcome. expect U.S. leadership as we head towards the special session to put some special emphasis on this area, would you expect? Sure. In terms uh, of US, using U.S. leadership? I mean, what you've described about David, you know, about uh, the OAS session, suggests that there's proof already of, <coughs> of some action in that area. Yep. I mean, actually, we probably don't want to have a tactical discussion at this particular point in time. First, it would give half of the people in this room a headache and the other half would fall asleep. But I would suggest that the United States of America has placed itself more or less in a position where it can influence the dialogue in the future because it has associated itself with neither of the two extremes. Neither those who espouse full prohibition, in other words, lock them up if they so much as think about it, uh, or if you think they might think about it, or the other extreme, those who say, let's just legalize everything and the entire problem would go away. We have placed ourselves in a position where we can influence, and I would like to think, help produce at least a majority, if not consensus, in this area. And this would be an area where so I would So in that could sweet do. middle ground where we're going to put all of our energies, looking ahead, what are the three or four things you want to take away from the special session in terms of practical advances in that middle zone? What are the concrete things that where you make use of the existing flexibilities to push the rest of the world to see things more in the way we want to see it. Well, first, I don't want to say people should see things the way we want to see them. I do believe the way we describe this is we should find some common ground that all 194 uh, member states of the United Nations can accept. I'll start, smarty pants, with at least two of the things that I said at the very beginning, and that is let's keep the basic architecture that we have, the three international drug control conventions, and let's keep a consensus in terms of resisting the large transnational criminal organizations. Then, what are we actually trying to accomplish within those two parameters? I do believe public health, and we can, uh, my guess is with 10 people and an hour, we could come up with 50 different proposals on public health, some of which we've already talked or talked around uh, in the course of, of our discussion here. Second would be criminal justice reform. Uh, in, in, a, in what I would describe as a logical, coherent way that is not going to require governments at either extreme to have to change their fundamental positions. Because ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations system, for good or for ill, uh, has developed over the last 70 years a tradition to operate by consensus. And what does consensus mean? It means that any individual government can basically stop an initiative if it feels strongly about it. What this says to a person like me who must operate in and within that system is I've got to find proposals, ideas, concepts that will be acceptable to some governments that are still executing drug traffickers and other governments who have completely legalized entire categories of products. I have come up with and suggested some of those ideas earlier today. 
sentencing reform in terms of how many life sentences do you have to serve for this purpose, uh, alternatives to incarceration, uh, adjudication processes uh, that are different or, or separate from the, the, the criminal justice system. These are the sorts of areas where I would like to think mm -hmm. we could find and develop some degree of consensus. But I do want to make it clear to everyone here, this is not going to be easy. If it were just us, the brilliant hundred people or so that are sitting in this room right now, by five o'clock this afternoon, we could have a perfect document to come out of the special session of the United Nations in 2016. Might take more than an hour, but what we truly could. But we are operating under a very different set of rules. And, 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 and that, sadly, uh, is, it, it is part of the reality that I was trying to describe. If you think Michael's got a complicated situation from time to time, uh, trying to keep some coherence among 50 states of the Union plus uh, the District of Columbia, ladies and gentlemen, may I repeat, 196 individual member states of the United Nations that operate by consensus. Boy, under those circumstances, I'd trade jobs with Dr. Botticelli any day of the week. Thank you. I want to come back to Michael with one big question, and then I want to open the floor for comments and questions. So please think a bit about what you might want to say. Michael, my question to you is, what more do you need, do you believe, in terms of tools or capacities to, to carry forward the mission? of your office, hmm. which, is, which is so expansive in a way, and, and it has very high ambitions attached to it. And you're in the process of multiple transitions of outlook and paradigms and partnerships. I mean, it's, it's striking reading through all the policy materials that you've generated. It's a very dynamic environment that you're trying to shape in multiple places around this country. So, where you sit, what, do you, what more, if you were to wish for an, an additional set of capacities and tools, what would those be? I've been, I've been in government so long, no one's really kind of given me a blank check before and say, what would you do? Um, I, you know, I, 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 I think a, a couple things. And, and one, I'll start with um, continuing to change public perception. I think is a really big area. That, that one of the areas that we know why people don't seek treatment is it's still riddled with shame and stigma. Mm -hmm. so, so one is, you know, if I had my magic wand, it'd be really changing how people with addiction are viewed. Being able to communicate and mobilize uh, opinion? I, I would love to see a more vibrant, politically active recovery movement in the same way that we've had movements in other areas mm -hmm. that have changed uh, public policy. Yeah. So, you know, we, uh, you know, people in, um, and I think that's changing, and I think people are beginning to come together and really having a vibrant political movement around mm -hmm. this, because I do think that that becomes uh, really uh, helpful. Um, you know the the second piece, and I and, and I do believe this. You know, we one of the things that that we have here in the United States, and you know, we've shared that resource uh, across the country. You know, we we lead the world in research as it relates to to good evidence based programming, and I think we need to con continue to focus on good evidence based programs, particularly as it relates to this criminal justice healthcare mm -hmm. intervention. I think we have you know, emerging models. I think we have a good few things out there, but we need a better armamentarium. To uh, make the case. To, to make the case, and also, I think, to hand to our law enforcement folks mm -hmm. and say, here are some good things. You know, we have a few of those out there. You know, mm -hmm. Drug courts are great, but you know, we don't want people having criminal records with that. Drug market interventions are promising. I think we have some other promising practices out there that are building, but we need a better armamentarium, I think, mm -hmm. of, of how can we have a different criminal justice response to this issue. So those, I think, would be two things. You know, resources are always important. And the other piece that, that, that I'll say, having done this work for a long time, the vast majority of treatment, quite honestly, has come from the public dollar. Mm -hmm. And private insurance needs to step up dramatically in terms mm -hmm. of, of, of how they provide a good benefit package for people with substance Thank use you. disorders. Thank you. Bill, what would make your job easier in terms of additional capacities and tools? Yeah. Uh, 
I'm tripling my budget for, uh, uh, for, for operations programs and activities overseas, and having a single coherent uh, and, uh, and consensus position uh, by the United States of America in terms of our drug policy. Since neither one of those is very likely uh, in the course, perhaps, of my entire lifetime, uh, I, I would say, uh, at the end of the day, uh, what is most, what would be most useful for me in this area uh, would be uh, a, 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 an approach where there is some degree of consensus within the United States of America that so long as we stay within these basic parameters, uh, we will be allowed and permitted to reach understandings and agreements to cooperate and engage bilaterally, regionally, and universally uh, in drug control issues around the world. I'm not sure we're going to get that either, uh, but this is what I'm trying to do when, when I testify and uh, before Congress and, uh, and meet with individual members is to try to, to clarify as much as possible the general direction in which we are trying to go so that this issue does not get caught up uh, in, in the sort of political dialogue that, that does make it very difficult uh, for us to, to get things done internationally. Thank you. Thank you. Let's open, open up for some comments and questions. And uh, we'll bundle these together. There's two gentlemen right in the middle here. We'll, we'll, we'll do. I guarantee you we'll get to everyone. Just be patient. Yes, please. Sure. Please uh, identify question. yourself and be very succinct. Dan Ripple, Marijuana Policy Project. Question for Mr. Botticelli. First of all, congratulations again on your nomination. It's exciting to see someone from the treatment world uh, heading that, that office instead of uh, you know the military or the law enforcement world. You've talked well, a lot about uh, I know, I know. in advance. Congratulations <laughs> in advance. You've talked a lot about the administration's position on marijuana and its its continued opposition to legalization. Um, nevertheless, the the president has also said that it's important that Washington and Colorado and other states that choose to regulate marijuana uh, are allowed to implement their laws and move forward with their laws. And in fact, the Department of Justice has issued guidance to those states, mm -hmm. alluding to what the ambassador mentioned about operating within parameters, saying that as long as these aid enforcement priorities aren't being implicated, then uh, the Department of Justice will not intervene. And, and to this point, they have not been implicated. CDC data shows that teen use has, has gone down, actually, in Colorado. So uh, my question is, do you agree with the administration's position there that, that states should be permitted to determine their own marijuana laws? Or would you prefer to see the federal government sort of impose federal law on all states, uh, you know, prohibition of marijuana, even in states that would prefer sure. a new approach? Hold on this for one moment. Uh, what I'd like to do is just bundle together three or four interventions, that's sure. okay. Yes. Uh, David Borden with StopTheDrugWar.org and the Drug War Chronicle newsletter. Uh, there's an issue that lies at the intersection of uh, our uh, cooperation internationally with other countries in drug enforcement on the one hand and uh, human rights and criminal justice uh, on the other hand. Uh, not every country shares our um, human rights standards in criminal justice. Uh, we, for example, do not have uh, the death penalty for drug offenses that don't involve violence. Uh, some countries do. Uh, there are international tensions right now following the execution in Indonesia of six uh, convicted drug traffickers with uh, dozens more such uh, executions uh, um, by Indonesia on the way. A number of countries have recalled their uh, ambassadors from there. The DEA, the DEA opened a branch office in Jakarta in 2011, one of uh, many such uh, offices around the world. We cooperate with Indonesia, uh, with China, with many countries that uh, have the death penalty for drug offenses. And so uh, my question is, as we um, move forward on criminal justice reform in the U.S. and seek to export that philosophy in our diplomatic relations, uh, uh, is reform also going to be operational in how we do enforcement and share intelligence, or is it only going to be at the policy level? For example, are we asking countries that we uh, work with on drug enforcement to uh, give us assurances uh, what we contribute to them won't indirectly lead to, lead to uh, executions for nonviolent offenses? Thank you. And 
other such issues. Thank you. Are there other hands in the back here, the folks? Why don't we come up here and take these two gentlemen right here, please? Yeah, uh, Detective Howard Wooldridge uh, from LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, Mr. Botticelli. Um, you said earlier in your remarks that uh, law enforcement plays a key component. Uh, I started in police work in 1974, and I've seen tsunamis of drugs come into this country, marijuana, LSD, then cocaine, then meth, uh, ecstasy, and now heroin has doubled. And it is my experience as a police officer that we have been the mosquito in the butt of an elephant. As you know, drugs today are cheaper, they're stronger, and quoting the DEA, drugs are readily available to America's youth. So my question is, why do you continue to have faith that my profession can have any impact on the drug trade, either nationally or internationally? These uh, DTOs, the drug trafficking organizations, are the Al Capones of the 21st century, and I know the, the only way we took down Al Capone and the rest is obviously to end prohibition. Thank you. Just hand over here, and then we'll hear from you, and then we'll come back to <coughs> the speakers. Yes. yes. Yes, sir. My name is Andre Sauvageau, and um, my company I work for is not involved in this thing, but I'm also a partner of the uh, President Obama's presidential partners and a member of the, a partner of the Human Rights Campaign. Now, my question is this, domestic. In getting the cooperation of the U.S. Congress to do the things that, to move towards that sweet spot you described, or what would make his life easier. Uh, leaving aside the probability of getting 67 votes, uh, is this an issue in which the cooperation could be relatively bipartisan rather than split along party lines? Uh, an example is the Trans-Pacific Partnership where the president will certainly need Republican cooperation. Your is, question is, 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 what is the probability, is, is this an issue, not probability, is this an issue that lends itself to Republican, Democratic... Which, which issue are you talking the, about? The issue of getting a consensus on U.S. drug policy to facilitate an effective approach to the international community through the United Nations. Okay, thank you. Michael, you want to start with some of the domestic sure. oriented questions and we'll come to Bill. Sure. So, so I think to your question in terms of what, you know, what, what's our response here as kind of other states think about doing this? I, I would say two things. I would agree. I think that many states are, um, are very, very interested in terms of what's happening in Colorado and Washington as they think about how they're going to move forward with this. You know, I think you know that you know, the Department of Justice, as it relates to what they've issued with Colorado and Washington, has, have uh, um, the have same approach with uh, Oregon and Alaska around this. And, and, and again, I think our response to this is to continue to monitor what happens in Colorado and Washington and in subsequent states to see one kind of is if there needs to be a different response from the Department of Justice and from this administration or, or to see if there are and, and what that might be. So do does it need tighter regulations um, or what are the possible options that the Department of Justice can take if it looks as if the, those criteria are not being met. So, you know, I, I think it's important to do that. You know, the, the president, as it related to the department, uh, as it relates to the district, I think was very clear that the district uh, should uh, um, stick to its home rule as a resident of the district. I, um, I might not agree about legalization, but I do agree with our own ability to spend our own money the way that we want to do that. So, you know, I, I think it's going to be continue important as we go forward to watch what happens as, as, as this rolls out. You, you know, I think to your question, the, you know, it's been very interesting for me to, to you know, I, I, I come from the public health side and the demand reduction world, and quite honestly, um, was not coming at this work from a kind of law-centric, um, but, but, you know, one of the things that, that um, I've come to appreciate, and particularly as it relates to the heroin issue here, there, there is a direct correlation between supply and demand that we can't ignore, right? And the heroin situation here we have is a good example. Part of the reason that we're in this situation, not only do we have untreated addiction that we have to do a better job with, and we need to do a better job at inter you know, intervention, but it's because we have such a plentiful supply 
right? And, and so we do have to focus on strategies that, that focus on um, getting the supply out of the communities. You know, if I think about effective public health strategies for a long time, if you think about tobacco, unfortunately I'm still a smoker, but it's harder and harder to find a place to buy a pack of cigarettes these days, and it makes one think um, about using those drugs. So, you know, getting bad stuff out of the community have, has been an effective public health strategy for a long, long time. So I do think that law enforcement has a key role to play, not only in getting bad stuff out of our communities and, and working with the criminal organizations. You know, I, I, I think it, it, it will have, it, it does have a synergistic effect as it relates to demand reduction. The, you know, the other piece, and I think you know this, is, you know, we, we do want to give law enforcement a different set of skills um, and practices to be able to not rely solely on arrest and incarceration as they approach people with addictive disorders. So I think it's really important for, for us to continue to focus on those kinds of interventions. Bill, can you yep. talk about the issue yep. that David raised with the, respect to the death penalty the, and also the... The human rights uh, intersection with, with counter-narcotics, yep. I mean, here's the way I would, uh, I suppose I would frame the issue. Uh, it, International relations, foreign relations, foreign policy, uh, are, are, are the, the intersection of, of lots of different issues. Human rights and democracy issues, law enforcement or counter-narcotics issues, uh, trade and commercial issues, economic issues, security issues, terrorism issues. At the end of the day, our relations with any individual country are a combination of all of those, and we, from our perspective, as a government, as a nation, and as a people, try to develop some sort of balance in, in each individual case as to what is most important, what is not. Uh, and obviously, uh, if, if all nations of the world were to determine not to have relations with a country that maintains a death penalty, well, actually, my job would become much easier uh, due to the fact that we would have relations with no other country in the world. At the end of the day, our job, again, is to, is to figure what, what are the priorities among those. Is it right uh, for us to have a liaison law enforcement relationship with a nation that in fact applies the death penalty in, in matters such as drug trafficking where we would not apply that penalty. Uh, uh, from my perspective, I would, I would address that question by saying, why do we want the liaison relationship? What do we get out of it in terms of are we protecting the American people? Mm -hmm. Is it accomplishing something? Is it getting a larger or feeding a larger objective? For example, uh, having a relationship with the largest, most populous Muslim country in the world, which does not have a significant extremist issue. How do we balance that against legitimate, proper, and correct human rights concerns and considerations and come up with a conclusion? And as is practically always the case in the hard issues, the conclusion will not be accepted or agreed to by everyone. Uh, it will, at the end of the day, be one uh, that has perhaps the largest non-majority accepting or agreeing with it. And may I wrap up on the bipartisan issue? Brother, I would love to think that uh, we could find something uh, in this matter that, that, that in fact does generate a bipartisan support. Uh, my only comment, and I've been in this government business now for 36 years, uh, this is a policy that is now under some degree of change and adjustment. And my own experience of the past 36 years is that is a time when it's rather difficult to find bipartisan agreement because things are changing. And that is the most difficult time, from my experience, to get everyone to come together and agree. I hope I'm wrong. We'll find out. Great. Let's uh, get another round of quick <coughs> comments and questions. We have a hand here. We have hand, two hands here. Please be very succinct, and we'll we'll gather together three or four, come back and close. Sure. Yes, sir. Thanks so much. I, I, my name is Dr. Malik Burnett. I'm with the Drug Policy Alliance. My question actually is twofold, uh, both uh, for each of you. Uh, my the first question is. Um, 
you know, as part of a group that would be deemed legalizers, uh, it is somewhat uh, erroneously concluded that we are not in concern for the well-being of uh, the youth of our nation. And so, um, as you were speaking, you were saying that you are articulated some somewhat of a third way or an alternative sort of path between prohibition and legalization. And I was wondering if you could expand on what that is. And then uh, for the ambassador, um, as it relates to um, International uh, Narcotics Control Board, uh, given the fact that uh, a large uh, amount of the teeth in that organization is perpetuated by the ability of the United States to control uh, monetary donations, what exactly are the ramifications of the United States as it changes its cannabis policy um, being negatively impacted by being out of compliance, if you will, with the uh, with the International Narcotics, uh, or with the International Convention. Can you hand that? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Abilash Kazula. My question is for both of you regarding the policy that Portugal passed in 2000. Um, so with the legalization of most illicit drugs, addiction rates have fallen by half, crime rates have fallen by a substantial amount. How do you see that impacting domestic policy in the United States, as well as reach a consensus on international policy at the UN? Can you just? Summarize that question slowly. Yeah, sorry. Um, so how do you see the impact of what happened in Portugal over the past 15 years impact domestic policy both in the United States and international policy uh, and consensus at the UN special hearings? Thank you, Portugal. And a hand over here is Portugal, yes. David Holliday, uh, Latin America program of the Open Society Foundations. The, um, the recent report, the policy report of the American Academy of Pediatrics also made a re recommended that marijuana be rescheduled as a Schedule II drug. I won't ask your position on that, but what are the obstacles in the future of that, and what would it mean from your perspective if marijuana was reclassified as a Schedule II drug? Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? There's one in the back. And we'll come back to our speakers and we'll wrap sort up. Sort of as a follow-up to that, Don Murphy with the Marijuana Policy Project. Mr. Botticelli, apparently yesterday morning you spoke before law enforcement officers where you suggested or you stated that uh, marijuana would remain classified as a tightly regulated Schedule One drug. And to quote you, they said, you said, uh, the administration continues to oppose attempts to legalize marijuana and other drugs. This opposition was driven by medical science and research. Would you care to comment on the medical science and research that you think suggest that marijuana and heroin should be on the same schedule, and do you believe that they are equally dangerous? Okay. Why don't we, why don't we come to Bill first here, and then to Michael, and then we can close. Bill? Sure. Um, I'll start uh, with the INCB question. Uh, and, and by the way, INCB is the International Narcotics Control Board. It is that body which was established by the United Nations uh, when uh, they, they, they ratified the 1961 uh, International First Convention on, uh, on Control of, narc of, psychotrop of Narcotic and Psychotropic Drugs. Uh, and the INCB's role, to a certain extent, is to, is to serve as referee uh, assessing whether individual member states are in compliance uh, with their treaty obligations, and it has a, a, a other more specific functions as well. Uh, I wish I could say we had a tremendous amount of influence on the INCB. Uh, there are, I believe, Dr. Green, 12, uh, 12 members, uh, of which one right now is an American citizen, and I'm not sure there's ever been more than one. Uh, and we do provide uh, whatever our proportional share is under the United Nations, uh, um, it's not a <coughs> system, uh, whatever it is that we pay into the United Nations system. Uh, we do provide to them. I can offer you uh, that over the last two years, I have not detected any, <laughs> any evidence at all of a substantial amount of deference by the INCB uh, to the United States government's presentations, despite the brilliance uh, with which those presentations have been made. Would you not agree, Mr. Green, that the presentations were made brilliantly? Your question goes beyond that, however, uh, and it does say, so what would be the impact 
uh, of the INCB finally making a, a definitive determination that the United States is out of compliance with its obligations under the three conventions. Uh, and that, by the way, that's an excellent question, and it's a question that I've been wrestling with uh, for more than a year now. Uh, I mean, the world would not end. The sun will still rise in the morning, and it will set in the evening, uh, and, and the republic will still stand. Th those are good things, it, so it's not, it's not an existential sort of issue. It does have an impact, I suppose, in terms of U.S. leadership, certainly in this issue, but perhaps in broader issues as well, as we attempt to encourage other governments to, to abide by their rules under the Human Rights Convention, for example, uh, or under tra the, the, the trade, uh, trade agreement of the WTO or other such uh, multinational conventions. We would have to factor that into our thinking, I would suggest. We also would obviously have to factor in uh, the, the impact of this in terms of the three conventions themselves. Uh, if, in fact, the nation that has exercised more leadership within the United Nations over the 70 years, the last 70 years, than any other nation is in overt and admissible admitted a non-compliance with its treaty obligations, I assume that would make it less likely uh, that other governments would, uh, would feel any sense of obligation to comply with their treaty obligations as well. I repeat, and, I, and on this I don't mean to, to, to overstate the case, it, it, it is not the end of the world, but there would be negative impacts, and my conclusion <coughs> is it would be better if we could convince the INCB that our domestic posture and position leaves us in compliance with our treaty obligations uh, than the reverse. And I will continue to make the argument that I have been making now for more than two years, uh, that our federal system, our continued commitment to the fundamental objectives of the three conventions, and that is to discourage the abuse of these particular products and our discretionary authority as a sovereign state to determine how our limited law enforcement resources would be applied to this problem set leave us in compliance with our treaty obligations. I believe it is an argument worth making. I believe it is a correct argument and I believe we are better off if we can get the INCB, convince the INCB to accept that argument. Uh, Portugal. Portugal. Uh, Portugal has been rolled out, as have a number of, of other uh, nations, uh, in, in terms of experimentation uh, with different approaches on drugs. The Netherlands, Switzerland at times, more recently Uruguay. Uh, look, my, my argument would be, uh, I put Portugal in the same category with virtually any other nation, and to which I will now add uh, the states of, of, uh, of Colorado and, uh, and Washington, uh, in terms of providing us uh, something that we can assess, monitor, and determine uh, what the impact of their national experiment is, uh, both in terms of positive and negative elements from, the, uh, from, from that approach. I mean, that's. Uh, I would not want to single Portugal out. I don't think they would want to be singled out uh, in terms of, uh, 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 of standing as a, as, as a single nation that the entire world looks to and determines whether this works or does not work. Portugal is a small nation. Uh, it is, for the most part, a very homogeneous nation. Uh, it, it is a, a nation that is both, uh, both limited in terms of population and in terms of geography. They have a different problem set, I suppose, uh, than you would find from a very large populous nation, uh, uh, a nation that is particularly rural or particularly urban, a nation that is multicultural in terms of who is there, a nation that is located, say, in the crossroads <coughs> of, of traditional smuggling patterns, my own view is Portugal is an additional data point as we, the people of the United States of America, and we, uh, the 190, I think it's six, uh, uh, member states of the United Nations, assess where we want to go with drug policy in the future. Thank you. Michael, there are a couple of questions on marijuana sure. for to you, though, as well as the question that Mike posed around how do you carve a third way? Sure. 
And, and let, let me just, because this might be a segue, I'll, I'll also talk about the Portugal piece because I think it's really interesting. And even when you look at some of the evaluation, you know, even, even, even institutes in Portugal freely talk about the fact of to the extent that they significantly increase their treatment resources may really be a profound effect here, right? So, so this leads into the third way approach, right? Because what we're saying here is, you know, we're really concerned with what some attendant health harms might be about legalization. We don't want to lock folks up. Let's focus on those public health strategies like increasing access to treatment as a solution to this problem, right? So, so I do think that even some of the good things that are might be coming out of Portugal, it, I, you know, and again, could be a significant result of the fact that they dramatically increased access to treatment and they've used the criminal justice system as a way to leverage people into treatment. So I think that that's really important to do. Let me talk, we had a couple questions about scheduling which I think are important. And one of the things I always hear is why is marijuana in the same category as heroin? And I think it's important for folks to know that drugs are not scheduled based on relative risk. Right? So it's really important that you understand that. Right? So this is basically, do they meet up or down criteria as it relates to the individual um, category? So, so I think we need to be careful when we start saying, well, why is marijuana in the same category as heroin? It's not a relative risk scale. I think the other piece that's really important, and I will say this too, you know, uh, the, the, uh, that because I think in the past it was a, a pretty fair criticism that the U USG, and particularly NIDA and others, were not doing an adequate job on investigating the potential therapeutics of marijuana as it relates to the, to the work that we do. And you know, NIDA has continually to amp up their efforts. They, they now have over 50 studies looking at the potential therapeutic value of the components of marijuana, right? So even the Institute of Medicine has, has come out and said, smoking marijuana is probably not the most efficient or health-minded delivery vi device for, for marijuana. And I think we would all agree with that, that that's not the case. So, so, so this is where the scheduling comes into place, because how do we rely on good science, good data to dictate what, how drugs are scheduled. And there is a process that DEA with, uh, uh, under HHS really looks at the scientific evidence as it relates to this issue. So, so it, it, you know, it's really important that I think we continue to support research um, and that looks at the potential therapeutic values of the components of marijuana. Thank you. We've gotten to the end of our time here. This has been extraordinarily rich, and I want to thank both of you uh, for joining us this afternoon. I want to thank all in our audience for sticking with us and putting, some, putting forward some great questions great. and comments. And we, Michael, we wish you the best of luck on Monday. Uh, that's a wonderful moment approaching. And please join me in he thanking hopes. our speakers. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you. I can't shake. Oh, that's right. I forgot.